Shalom, balance, welcome back all. We are back in the lab. And again, I'm bringing some more feminine energy with me. I have with me the world-renowned, the incomparable one, uh, Laura Sanko, a former professional fighter, presenter, broadcaster, and I think a little bit of everything in between as well. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Quite the, uh, quite the introduction. That is a lot to live up to, including the feminine energy. I don't know how feminine uh, I am today, but I will, uh, I'll do my best to bring that side of me out. <laughs> <laughs> no problem at all. So thank you again for um, coming on the broadcast. What we are, are going to attempt to do is to get to know you in a little bit more detail, um, past, present, and future so let's let's take it back let's take it back so you're you're currently in kansas yeah i technically missouri it's very confusing since the name of the city is kansas city but yes, it, yes. I, I'm, I'm in casey yeah casey okay is that where you grew up uh essentially um i moved here when i was about seven so i wasn't born here but i i was raised here and have lived here most of my life i spent i spent a few uh years living in new york city uh under under a different career path, okay. uh, but mostly here, yes. Okay, so so going going back, so we're we're still in early years. So growing up, what was your what was your aspirations? What was your sort of your 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 potentially ideal career as as a youngster? Wow, that is a great question. In fact, I don't even know if I've ever been asked that before. It certainly wasn't this. Uh, <laughs> it certainly wasn't what I'm currently doing. Um, you know, I think. Maybe not so much as a small kid, but in high school, I was really, really science oriented. I loved science. I did really, really well in science. Uh, I kind of, I even got sent away to one of those smart kid camps where we studied cancer and did all mm. sorts of stuff. Um, so I, I think for a long time there, I, I, I thought I'd be a doctor or do something in, uh, in a science-based field. And then I just decided to punch people. <laughs> <laughs> very different transition, wasn't it? Very, very. Um, well, I guess, I guess at some point through the, your science sort of um, growing and um, sort of learning, I guess physiology, physiology and biology must have played a part in that? I mean, possibly. I think more um, interesting, I think it's, you got to dial it back a little bit further even than that. I think that my, um, I, have a, I'm a, I have a very curious mind. Okay. And that always lent itself to science. And I think it lends itself to uh, wanting to know the why of everything, mm -hmm. whether that's why a certain punch lands effectively in a certain situation or why a fighter is the way that he or she is and what their story is. So I just, I think it all comes from this. I'm one of those people where I, I can't, I can't let my mind rest mm -hmm. until I answer a question. I will I will ruin a dinner out, I will ruin a dinner out by, by Googling on my phone because some random topic comes up that I just, I have to find out about because I don't know. So yes, I think that's yes. really, that's really what it is. Knowledge is power. And it clearly, it seems like uh, early on in our conversation that clearly you, you, you have a thirst for knowledge and like to understand new information, grasp new ideas and stuff like that. Yeah, I do. And I think it's part of the reason why um, another reason I, I can ruin a dinner party <laughs> is because this should be the name of the show. Why Laura Stanko can ruin a dinner party uh, is because I'm, I'm one of those people that is annoyingly, oh, I've done that. I've done that. You know, I, I, I have, um, done, <laughs> I'm not going to say well, uh, but I've done a bizarrely v varied, uh, number of things in my life, whether it's career paths or just activities I've gotten into for a period of time. And they're all over the board. But I think that's what it comes down to is something will pique my interest even a little bit. And I'll just, I'll just go balls to the wall okay. uh, in, in like uh, discovering what it is. And I used to ride horses competitively. I got a scholarship for piano performance. Like I'm, I'm all over the place. <laughs> Very varied. So if you enjoy something and you're interested in something, you, as you say, you're going to give it 110%. 
Yeah, that's not how I phrased it. You phrased it much more eloquently. Thank you. <laughs> um, so based upon that, then, let, let, me, let me take a wild guess. Star sign-wise, based Ooh. upon your, what you've just said, could you possibly be... I'm going to go for two. My first thing I would say would be either uh, would be a Gemini. No. The second one would be a, a Capricorn. No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> totally wrong. Okay. It's all right. I was, ready. I was, I was so ready with the clapping. I was so ready. I was so ready. I'm a Sagittarius. Sagittarius. Okay. Yeah. I'm December 7 is my birthday. Early. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. I don't know much about the signs. Does that mean I'm a blend? Like, am I early in the... Exactly. What, what You're early wow. in the cusp. You're early in the cusp. So you can have traits of, Cap uh, of, of Capricorn as well. Um, okay. But yes. Okay. Okay. So moving forward, what, what was the... What was the moment or the catalyst that made you say, I want to, as you say, punch people in the face and possibly submit them? Um, I think that's another thing that just sort of um, built up in me over time uh, and not in any sort of angry way. I just, I had an older brother. Uh, I still have an older brother. I don't mean to make it sound like he's passed away. Um, and, I, and we were extremely close growing up extremely close. I was kind of the uh, little mascot of his group of friends. So I basically grew up around guys, guys mm -hmm. that were four to five years older than I am. So I was always a little bit guyish in that way, a little bit of a tomboy. And I was always trying to keep up and I was always trying to impress them and, you know, get their attention. So I tended to do things that were maybe a little bit outside of the box. The other the other component to this is that I grew up in a very conservative religious uh, household, very, very conservative. And I think while I, I still, um, I, I actually, I appreciate how I was raised and I still um, practice my faith. It just looks a lot different than what my parents wish it did. <laughs> it's evolved. Uh, yes, it's evolved greatly. Um, I think that that being in the in the background of everything I did, there was probably a little part of me that that wanted to be wild or unconventional in my own way. So I started doing martial arts uh, when I was a young teenager, and but what did more you of start this doing was it karate? Judo? Kar ah. Karate. Yeah, yeah, I wish yeah. I had started in judo, man. Judo or jujitsu. I wish I had started in one of those arts, but I didn't. I started in karate, um, and I got my black belt at the end of high school. Um, and then I really didn't do anything after high school. And it wasn't until I went through a really tough time in my personal life, which I'm happy to talk about or, or not, either way. <laughs> uh, I went, went through a tough time in my you. personal life after college and I just needed, I needed a distraction and I needed an outlet to allow me to take my mind off of what was going on in my life. And I, there are very few, first of all, exercise is a great antidepressant. Mm -hmm. And then, but jogging, for instance, doesn't do it for me. Cause then when I'm jogging, I just think more I'm that's, I'm alone with my thoughts and that's not good when I'm in a bad place. Right. Yes. So, and same thing with weightlifting. So I sought out an activity where when you're doing it, you literally cannot think about anything else. Cause it, you're, it's so in the moment. Yes. Um, and, and I would find myself after two hours on the mat and I was, man, I was so intense with it at first because it was my escape. I would find myself after two hours, I would just feel better. You know, the problems would still be there, but yeah. my, my brain didn't feel quite so uh, wrapped up in it. And that's it was really that what rest of sorts after, after having the, that sort of competition on the mat. What's that? Your brain was at rest of sorts yes. after. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> you know. uh, <laughs> you're like how do I phrase this <laughs> so uh, uh, without obviously going into too much detail I guess it was a personal relationship that was potentially yeah yeah, yeah no it's it's okay I don't mind talking about it I um you know I think it was funny because when you asked your first question it made me it, it dovetails into this discussion as well um I got married when I was 23 uh to my first husband this is I'm this is my second marriage. This okay. is my second one. Oh. Um, I got married when I was 23. And I think part of that uh, disaster was 
you know, I grew up not necessarily, it's not like my parents were telling me you have to get married and that's the goal, but it's a little bit implied sometimes in religious settings that for, you know, for a woman to grow up and have um, a family and, and raise her children in the Lord is that's, that's the ultimate, um, that is the goal. They don't necessarily put a time limit on it, but a lot of people in that group get married pretty young. Also due to the, you know, let's not have sex before we're married whole thing. Um, so I did that and it was terrible. <laughs> oh dear. I was married, dear. Yeah, I was married six months and um, it was not good. Uh, he, he had some, uh, some psychopathic tendencies that I discovered pretty quickly. And so I, I, I fled that situation, but I also was carrying around a lot of guilt and embarrassment over, because mm -hmm. my whole life I'd been like, prom queen, valedictorian, you know, never got in trouble. Can you explain? I, I, I hear that term, valid, valid, what was it, valedictorian? What, what, yeah. what is that? What actually is that? A valedictorian means that you graduated first um, in your senior high school class. So your last year of what we consider high school over mm -hmm. here before you move on to university, um, you got the top grades of anybody in your class. Great. Okay. Wow. Oh. So, I had been on this path to perfection and then here I went and fucked up the one thing that I was mm. really not supposed to fuck up, which is marriage and life. So I was, um, I was, I was reeling from that. And, and that's when I found MMA and, and MMA went on, I would say another two times later throughout my life to kind of save me in a similar sense, not from a relationship issues, yes. but other tough times. It, it, it's your quote unquote safe and happy place. It really is. It really is. Which, which sounds weird to people who watch it on TV and only see it as violence, but yeah. it's, it's, it's a lot more than that for sure. It is. It really is. And, and these are one of the, the, the reasons I like to, to have conversations with presenters, former fighters, current fighters, just to not just hum, uh, humanize them, but to re let people understand that there is a really bigger picture out there and people are very diverse and do things for very different reasons. Um, and ultimately it's about the drive for competition, um, yeah. for success, um, and to ulti ultimately to win. I think there's been, um, some people don't necessarily carry the full, um, aspects of martial arts through when it comes to professional fighting, where, you know, you get some antics that take place because generally it's supposed to be about testing your skills, your wits, your, your abilities. And at the end you shake hands and it's, you know, you did good, but you won maybe, or, you know, I think we need to get back to the real core essence of what martial arts is. I agree with that. It's, it's, it's beautiful um, when it's done that way. And I, I had a lot of reservations about allowing my son to watch MMA a whole lot when he was little just I'm not overly protective but it's just it can be a lot when you don't really feel like they understand what's going on but mm -hmm. it just I watched so much of it and it's such a part of my life that I realized it was going to be impossible to keep him from watching it with me so I kind of went the other way to where no matter what's going on I just don't allow it to be a big deal and I've, I've talked to him a lot about how you know this is not the difference between this and violence mm -hmm. is that in a violent act, someone doesn't want to be there. Someone, someone is aggressing toward another person and that person who's being um, ag aggressed upon, I'm sure that's not even a verb, um, doesn't want to be there and, and, and wishes they were not in that situation. And that's not the case here. And so I always point out to him the fights where after they just are going to war, they're hugging each other. And I said, see, this is not, that's, you wouldn't do that if this was a violent situation. So. I agree with you. I think that that's some of the most beautiful moments in MMA are after a hard fought fight and sometimes a lot of trash talk in the build up to it. And then it's just gone because it was released. Yes. Uh, that's a key word. It's released in that moment in that, in those 15 minutes or those 25 minutes, it's, yeah. it's put out there. You've bore your everything. You've potentially even not just sweat you've exchanged you've exchanged blood as well so that is as close as you can get to someone in uh, a physical sense um you know battle wise so yeah i think more people need to and also that's the end result of months 
of years of training, multiple different disciplines, grappling, wrestling, jujitsu, boxing, kickboxing, whatever, and then your specialist type stuff. There's a lot that goes behind before we actually see that finished pro um, product and so on, so so much and then as you say the the self-promotion of the fighters trying you know trying to get their name out there so they can you know potentially climb up in the ranks and get fights that they you know that they, that, that they want rather than you know get in other competition uh it's a it's a balancing act it really is a balancing act um and i think with the right team and the right clearly mentality you, you can you can be successful you can be successful i think that f for me um i'm starting to realize a lot more now that the fighters need to be a bit more selfless um in respect to what they're actually doing and what stage they're on whether it's the ufc whether it's bellator pfl one championship you know you've got a, you, you are fulfilling your dreams you're getting paid trustfully as much as, you know, uh, you're worth. But you're also a, a potential role model to thousands and thousands of people. And that's a, that's a big responsibility. Some people wear it well. Other people, it's, it's, it's challenging. It can be challenging. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think, um, I think a lot of fighters are, are becoming more and more aware, especially with the prominence of social media these days, of how important their platform really is. You know, you sp see people like Dustin Poirier or uh, Francis Ngannou have these incredible charities that they have, you know, this career has allowed them to give, and certainly that's not the extent of the list, it's just two people that come to mind. Mm -hmm. This, you know, this platform allows them to really give back in a way that otherwise uh, they wouldn't necessarily have the, the megaphone, you know, to be able mm -hmm. to do. I will say though, I think, as much as I would love everyone to have this very spiritual martial arts only approach to MMA, I, I do appreciate, and I don't mind the, the mixture of personalities and takes on, I think people can cross lines and I, I don't mm -hmm. love that of course, but I do think it takes all kind. You know, I, um, I look at the, the Jorge Masvidal's and the Colby Covington's of the world. And frankly, the storylines wouldn't be nearly as interesting if we didn't mm -hmm. have people um, that rubbed us the wrong way or people that inspired us in a maybe, you know, I'm thinking of Jorge here where like, I wouldn't necessarily call him a role model, but he's real. And that, that part of him, I very much look up to. I mean, that guy is literally what you see is what you get every moment of the day. And when it comes to someone like Colby, I don't love how he promotes himself, but I also, I do appreciate it. And I've, spent i hate to ruin his his <laughs> game here his charade but like i've spent time around him a little bit when the cameras are not rolling mm. and he is one of the easiest people to work with he's so nice he's so polite uh he's low maintenance which you would not expect him to be so i i, I can also get behind some of the showmanship and and the characters mm -hmm. uh that the that mma brings out in people I would agree. I would totally agree. And the, the, the two examples you brought up there are good examples to bring because they're polar opposites. Um, Game Brit, as you say, he's as real as it gets of sorts. But as you say, I mean, if, if I know with social media and there's so much that's happening within the world and stuff, fans and people generally have fickle memories. If we rewind back to not, not too long ago, three years ago, Colby was the most polite, humble person you know, you'd ever meet, you know, um, and that would be on camera, off camera. For whatever reason, he stated that it's down to him not getting fights and promoted well, etc. He's had to create this sort of WWE style, Henry, uh, Henry Cejuto kind of wrestling persona kind of thing yeah. to get somewhere. But he's, he's very, very skilled. Um, I think it was very unfortunate. Um, the title fight between him and Kamaru. Wow. Very, very unfortunate. It was an excellent back and forth. I did expect them to mix it up a little bit more, but clearly both was worried about each other's wrestling prowess. Yes. Um, but I just think, I really think, and I know it's sports entertainment and the, 
there clearly seems to be a bigger focus on the entertainment side versus the, the sporting side. I think really, based upon the controversy, that should have been run back as a, as a part two. I know it's still there in the future, potentially, you know, um, but that should have been, that should have been a part two. It was so late. What was it? 20 sec, 40 seconds, 20 seconds at the, the fifth less, round. I know it was less than a minute. I know it was less than a minute and man, and it was such a good fight up to it that was. point. Such a great fight. I agree with you. I would, I would absolutely love to see that fight again. I'd love to see him fight Jorge and you know, I, I he's, whether he's has needed to take it as far as, you know, like when he was the comments about Matt Hughes and stuff like some oh. of the stuff he said, like, Oh my God, yeah. please. Wow. I can't believe you just went there. Um, definitely. He's crossed the line a few times yes. in my book, but I would say overall his tactic has worked and the long game of when he's done with MMA, setting himself up for potential transition into, you know, WWE is so smart. Mm -hmm. So smart. Cause Everybody in this sport has got to think about their future after this sport because it's not, it's not an old guy's game, you know. It certainly isn't. It certainly isn't, as we saw from the the last um, events with uh, Shogun. <laughs> I and guess it the... can be sometimes, but <laughs> it's 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 a rarity. I mean, physically, with with all of the, as I say, you know, the training and the preparation before the fight, it's it's a lot, and then actually to you know, you've got people still do heavy sparring which you know I think in these days with the growth of MMA um, and the technology and the knowledge about head traumas and stuff people are still putting themselves through the ringer and the older you get up there um, it's it's a lot it's a more of a risk there's a lot more risks involved in that respect so yeah maximize the time that you've got um, look for the avenues whether it's presentation um, color um, broadcasting, going into WWE, you need to find something which you are happy with um, and you can make some additional revenue because this fighting game is, it doesn't last forever. It really it doesn't. doesn't. And uh, it doesn't. And most, most fighters are not going to have the type of financial windfalls that allow them to set themselves up for the rest of their life. You know, I think John Jones could probably retire and not have to work again, but that's that there's only a hand people handful of, of fighters that I think could really say that and feel like they've just set themselves up for the rest of their life. So people have to think about the vast majority of the roster has to think about life outside of MMA. And it's tricky because when you're in the sport and you're consumed by it, it's the only thing you see. It's the only thing you love. It's the only thing you want to do. And um, coaching and running a gym is, is tough and not everyone is capable of making that a success either. So. Well, that seems to be one of the, it seems like a, a natural progression. I love, you know, fighting, training. I'm technically good in certain areas. Why not open up a gym? It, it seems like a natural progression, but from what you're saying and from the, the conversations I've had, it, it's a very tough game. Cost-wise, your overheads, paying, in, you know, staff and stuff like that. It's not as easy as some people think it might be. Yeah, I, there's very, there are very few people, I feel like, that have done that truly successfully. And I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be, I feel like, involved and friends with one of the better examples of that in James Krause. You know, his, oh, yes. his gyms and his, I mean, his series of, uh, series of gyms, I should say, because there's, he's got the main one and then sister gyms that he started beyond that, that he uh, shares ownership in. It's pretty incredible. And anybody who, um, has questions about their future and, and, and what, whether they should open a gym or not or what they should do. I mean, he is such a good person to look to as an example and reach out to him. I mean, and ask him questions because it's funny. I, I live actually about, I don't know, maybe half a mile as the crow flies from him. Wow. Even though I live on a ranch, he lives, he just bought a million dollar house um, on the lake. That's, uh, that's just a ways off from me. So from where, he came from, which was, you know, a trailer park in a really shitty town in Missouri to, to where he is now is, is awesome. It's been nothing but hard work. It takes, it takes a really, it's a certain type of personality, not just a love of MMA. It takes a certain type of personality to be able to uh, be an entrepreneur and really run a gym like a successful business. I mean, you can, you can love MMA. You can even be a good coach, but to run a successful gym is a whole nother skill set that's not for everybody. You are, <clears throat> excuse me, you're indeed correct. It's, it's 
running a business, gym, whatever it is, it's it's many people can do that, but to run a successful one that takes a special person, a lot of sleepless nights potentially, long hours, dedication, and uh, everything in between kind of thing. <laughs> oh, absolutely, a lot of time away from the family too, unfortunately. Repeat that again, sorry. I said a, a lot of time away from the family as well. Oh. I mean, there are a lot of sacrifices that you know yeah. you know, life make to to make that gym successful. Definitely, definitely. So going back to your your fighting career, where did how did that how did that start? Did you start? Um, I guess would you have to do amateur to a few amateur fights before yeah. you go? Okay. Yeah. So um so like I said, I started training um just as a distraction because I wanted to learn another martial art that was less, you know, chopping at the air, mm -hmm. <laughs> more contact. And uh I just fell in love with it and was I was fortunate at the time that where I started training, I was essentially getting a four hour private lesson every day for the first year. I, mm -hmm. I kind of ran into a Kansas City UFC OG by the name of Rob Kimmons. He was one of the first fighters out of this area to make it to the UFC. And it was just by happenstance that I came across him and his main training partner. And they allowed me to kind of like shoehorn myself in there. I had to beg him for a while though. It was not an immediate like, oh yeah, you can sure, sure you can come train with us random small girl. <laughs> um, it took a lot of like convincing him, them that I was there to work and I really wanted to learn. But once they let me in, it was, like I said, it was, I was getting so much, it was just us and mm -hmm. I was getting so much one-on-one -on -one instruction and I was there all the time. So uh, I feel like I picked it up. And then I moved away to New York city and trained there for a few years. And then when I moved back to Kansas city is when I joined um, what is now glory MMA and fitness it had a different name at the time. And back then James was just a, uh, a teammate, mm -hmm. but the whole, the, the, the culture of the gym was like, fight everybody here fights you know it's cool if you want to come here and work out but come on like let's get you a fight and I, I kind of took them a while to talk me into it, taking one amateur fight they were like oh be a good you know story to tell the grandkids one day and <laughs> I don't back down from a from being goaded into much so I, I I decided to do it and then just fell in love with that feeling of um imposing my will on someone which makes me sound a little sick in the head but <laughs> she she Not knows she was there willingly so uh <laughs> <laughs> exactly fair exchange yeah yeah no it was it was amazing and then i i had uh i can i had seven or eight amateur fights i think i was seven and one i was either six and one or seven and was as an amateur i don't remember because um i had so many fights cancel and fall through mm -hmm. and none of the websites have all of my fights but I think I was seven and one as an amateur and then uh, had the one pro fight in Invicta. How was that experience? Cause at that time that was, it was a pretty new kind of organization. Yeah. yeah. It was incredible. And I'm not gonna, it was, I was thinking about it and this is going to make me sound petty or I don't know, but last night um, a teammate of mine, Alexa Culp fought, had her pro debut in Invicta and she got a second round rear naked choke. Uh, and they were showing clips of our whole gym was at the gym with our big screen. Everybody's there watching and screaming, mm. cheering her on. Back when I had my pro debut in Invicta, <laughs> and I also got a second round rear naked choke finish. No one gave a shit. <laughs> 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 because like you say, it was, it was a new promotion and no one really knew what it meant. I mean, at the time though, it really was the it was the top of the mountain for women's MMA because women were not yet in the UFC. So um, I, I, it was an incredible experience. I was fortunate that most of my amateur fights took place on Titan FC. And even at that time, it was televised on a channel here called Axis. So through, even during my amateur career, I had cameras in my face and, and kind of had the feel of a big show. We had, you know, Jamie Varner and Bobby Lashley were some of the fighters that were legends I was on. yeah so like i had a little taste of um what it felt like to be in a bigger promotion really early on so that kind of helped with the transition to invicta for sure okay so you had your one professional fight <laughs> and what made so what was the transition um between and what was the time frame in between that and your current work that you're doing? 
So um, I won my fight and I got the finish and I was so pumped and so excited and I immediately got rebooked for another fight and I started camp and um, I really did not like how my weight cut went for that fight. It was really, really tough, really tough. And so, so go ahead. can I ask what, yeah. what, what sort of weight were you cutting to get down to? I weighed about, I weighed then about this. I still kind of weigh the same, which is about 118 walking around. So 13 pounds. I mean, I would kind of diet down and lean down to maybe 114. Okay. Um, okay. And then cut from 114 to 105, which I know sounds like not very much when we hear about all well, these. Well, no, I just percent. think, I still think oh. this weight cutting thing, I, just, I, I understand it of sorts, but I still can't wrap my head around it. I think, I know, I, I, I'm going to get slated for this, but I just think if you weigh 118, you should fight at 118, <laughs> you know. Uh, it, yeah, listen, you're not going to hear too much of an argument from me. I mean, obviously, you, you've got to create some weight classes, and then if you have too many it kind of dilutes the meaning of a championship belt. And I mean, and people are always going to try to find an edge. So they're always, I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of a cultural thing that I don't know if it's going to go away anytime soon, but I do feel like it's changing. I feel like it's changed a lot in the last three years. Mm-hmm. You're seeing more and more people fight closer to their weight class. But even then, like I have a teammate who, I probably, I'm trying to decide whether how much I should say, <laughs> but he's a, he's a, he's a featherweight and, uh, he's on vacation right now. And he's certainly not out of shape because he just fought, just fought. Mm-hmm. And he's where, you know, walking around low nineties, one, one ninety. What? 192. Yeah. Yeah. That's now that being said, everyone, including our coach has been like, you're never seeing featherweight again. We're yeah. not allowing you to do that to yourself again. You're fighting lightweight, but even then, cutting the lightweight's oh, not know. easy. Yeah, I mean, you're right. You are right. I mean, you couldn't have uh, like a thousand different weight classes, but I just think, you know, I mean, I think with one championship, do they they do like hydration tests, and then you basically fight around. So I think you can only cut like is it five pounds or something? So some it's a small amount of I think, weight. Yeah, that. I don't know the exact, um, the exact regulations that they have, but that sounds about right. Um, and they do, they do hydration tests in certain States here, but not everywhere. You're you're right. That, and it's still, it's still an issue for. Yeah. You still with us, Laura? All right, sorry. I think we had a hiccup there from the uh, from the technology not loving. But you know, honestly, you're in the UK. I'm here. This is this is magic. If yes, uh, if I'm <laughs> it certainly is. But we don't have um, cauldrons and broomsticks. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. I do. You just can't see it. I'm back here. I'm stirring. I'm stirring. Um, <laughs> what I was what I was saying though was yeah, our, our Grant. He's not. He's not going to make featherweight ever again. Even that cut to 55 is tough. But yeah, the, and the cut that I was making in 105 was, was also tough, even though it was just seven pounds. I, you know, I couldn't, I would lose my hearing. I was bleeding out of orifices. I won't mention that I'm not supposed to be bleeding out of. So it was, yeah, it's kind of a mess. Yes. Trust, trustfully. I mean, uh, as you say, and there's been a last two to three years, there's been a plethora of of, um, fighters moving up um, in weights, some having great success, others, like Kevin Lee, for instance, he's kind of up and down and he's got tremendous talent. I think he he's, he's with a good team now. He's with a good team. Um, he had an excellent victory, but I think that last one in Brazil, was it Cowboy? Was it, um, was it Oliveira? Was it Oliveira? Oh, ew, you're testing my memory. This is where, this is where I fall short as a uh, reporter. When people ask me when or where are certain matchups in the past, my mind, it's such a jumble. Well, because you, you're so far in, in, in advance, to be fair, because you're thinking about what fights are coming up as well. So uh, it would be I hard. I wish I had a brain that retained information in that way. My, my boss is like that. He can tell you when, where, 
the details i I'm, i wish my brain worked like that well you, you, your your talent is 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 elsewhere let's play that way <laughs> <laughs> so what what are you what would you what would you think um dream matchup wise if you if you could speak to uh to uncle dana um what what matchups would you make for this year and it, and obviously this is fantasy so it doesn't matter if they've just fought or the hurt so you okay. can go for anything Ooh, well i would love to see i would love to see jorge versus i mean honestly the fight i want to see and i don't even know that it makes tons of sense right now but it makes sense on a certain level i'm dying to see jorge versus mcgregor but i think that they will I think that they'll probably keep that one in the back pocket because the gate on that would be yeah. ridiculous. Bananas. Ridiculous. So I can see them kind of not wanting to, you know, to do that right now. I'll watch Jorge fight anybody. I think that last fight was not his greatest performance for a number of reasons, but when you watch round one, that to me is an indication of what he's capable of in terms of wrestling. And he looked damn good, if you yeah. ask me. Um, and that being said, Kamara Usman, it's hard to, it's, it's hard to think of anybody that's going to really, that you're like, oh yeah, he's going to go in there. He's going to take care of business. Kamara is a tough, a tough puzzle for anybody to figure out. Um, I'm super, well, this isn't a dream matchup. This is happening. I'm super excited for the Habib Justin fight. That's going to be mm. bananas as well. Um, who have you got? Who have you got? Email fights. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. So who have you got for Khabib and Gaethje? It's hard not just you gotta have i feel like you have to go habib almost you almost have to He's as been. much as i am i am sold on justin gaethje so and i have been for a while to be clear i have been for a long time um and that last performance was magical exactly i just don't know if anybody can beat habib i just don't know I understand the sentiment and I would partially agree, but based upon what Gaethje was able to do to Al Kakui, and it was so hard to watch that fight. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there wasn't much takedown defense and um, takedowns of sorts that took place in that fight. It was pretty much a stand up bell, but yeah. his calmness and demeanor that he's had, he, he's, he's had over the last two fights now. I yeah. think he's that much polished i think he's at his peak peak now with those chopping leg kicks that he's got oh my he, days he uh, <laughs> khabib's got problems yes and here's the thing i think about that makes justin gaethje's kicks so special in my mind justin gaethje can leg chop you from boxing distance yes almost from clinch distance mm -hmm. He can, the way that his hips work, and I think too, he's got shorter arms. So when he's in the pocket, he's really in the pocket. And it's incredible how he can connect with a leg kick when he's in boxing range. Yeah, Not many exactly. people can do that. Most people kick from the outside. Justin Gaethje can kick from the outside also, but he can kick when you're clinched up with him. It's yeah. unreal. And people, you don't find that. So people are not used to dealing with that. And that's a problem. That is a freaking problem. Do you want to get that close to Habib? Uh, I would think not. But I think the key for Justin in that fight is going to be his ability to get off the fence. Because Habib's wrestling in the open mat, to be honest with you, isn't like, I, I'm not, my jaw's not hitting the floor when he's shooting a double leg on the open mat. He's, he's obviously, it's Habib. He's really good. Yes. But where he's really, really good is pinning you up against the cage and then just the the shot the reshot up down yes. up down and then just you know completely taking away all of your posts your ability to defend yourself and then just beating you to a pulp in that manner so it's gonna be a great now you got me all excited about that <laughs> oh no <laughs> and has, it's been announced as well hasn't it isn't it october sometime yes yeah. yes yeah so yes and obviously thoughts and prayers are with the uh, the family um, for the, the the loss of his father and stuff, so it's it was interesting to see that he he made the decision to have that that uh, turnaround so quick. I was potentially thinking he would wait until twenty twenty one, but can, correct me if I'm wrong. Is it a hundred percent correct that he's only doing two fights and he's going to retire? 
that's what he stated pretty clearly. And he seems like a guy who doesn't say things yeah. like that, the heck of saying it. So yeah, I think two fights and then, um, and then he's going to, he's going to hang it up, which I applaud him for, you know, for doing that, for getting to the mountaintop potentially, mm. and then calling it good. Um, I think these last two fights are going to be pretty special. And I, I was with you. I was, I was worried that we might not see him for a long time. Mm. Um, maybe ever, you know, when you've accomplished that much and you've gone through what he's been through, how close he was with his dad, it's not unheard of to think that that just completely changes your priorities and your mindset. But it sounds like his dad's desire was always for him to be 30 and 0. Yes. So that's his new, his new goal. So Gaethje next, October. Trustfully, Tony can knock one out the, um, out the um, box and we could Possibly, if Dana can do it, do a sixth time matchup because I, I think I really, really think. I mean, obviously, the last performance with Al Kikui was, you know, that wasn't him there. But just with his style that he's got, he's hittable clearly, and he's made some some comments to say, "Look, I can't get hit like that anymore." Um, I just think that Tony is just the. It's like. I don't know. It's it's that kind of style that he's got, that funk, that funk jutsu that he's got, snap jutsu mm-hmm. even. Um, I think that would be a very good matchup. I think that would be a, a, a good back and forth. And with those elbows he's got off his back, the submissions he's got, I think I think we need to see that. I think we definitely need to see that before he goes. I don't think we need to have the talks with him and McGregor running it back again. I think he was decisive what happened. McGregor had some very good rounds with his takedown defense. We can't deny that. Mm -hmm. But Khabib did what he did, submitted the guy. I think he needs to fight people who he hasn't fought fought before and get that victory. If he wants that 30 and 0, to get the rematches, I know it would, it would clearly be lots of money involved if there was a, a Khabib and or Khabib and um, Connor too. But I think we do Gaethje, we do Ferguson, and then he can sail off into the, the sunset trustfully with his 30 and 0 in, in, intact. That would be my sort of wish. That would be incredible. I, it is unbelievable to me that that fight has been booked five times. How... And the circumstances under surrounding the cancellation. I mean, I, I'm not a very superstitious person, but how can you not think that that matchup is just, yeah. is cursed? Yeah. It's crazy. Mm. It's just crazy, but I want to see it. I so desperately want to see Every, it. I'm with you. Everybody wants to see it. Everybody does. I, 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 the, the quote unquote MMA gods, they've got to make it happen. At some point before 2021's out, we're going to see that poster again for the sixth time and they're actually going to be in the octagon fighting. Maybe maybe the one thing that would go right in 2020. The one thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, 2020 is a kind of a write-off, but thanks to Dana and um, the owners, you know, we've at least had some combat sports for the yeah. last few months that has been excellent we had the the bellator event recently today we had one championship on as well and um, so it seems like we well news wise <laughs> it's crazy um yeah. and there's more stuff taking place with further lockdowns within the uk and stuff but it was for me at least it kind of felt like things were kind of getting back to normal of sorts as i say two more other major MMA promotions were holding events as well. I was thinking, okay, and sporting, yeah. I think, isn't it? Um, MLB, they're, they've been going for a bit, haven't they? Yep, yep. It's kind of been limping along. We've had some cancel- cancellations, and, and it doesn't feel like a normal season. But, yeah, I think p- things, are, things are slowly coming back. And I don't know, maybe it's the eternal opti- optimist in me, but I feel like, um, I, I, I feel like after this current – oh my gosh, it's happening again moment um, that we will be will be heading toward more and more normalcy. Um, it's funny because it's, it, it's very different here where I live compared to other parts of the United States, compared to the other, other parts of the world. Um, and I, I have to remind myself that other people are, are living in areas that are much more affected by this. But where I am, and then of course me working for the UFC, I've been really fortunate that uh, other than some inconveniences my life hasn't been 
um, affected too greatly. So I hope that I hope that we can all get back to business as usual soon enough. Definitely, definitely. Um, it, it's it's challenging to say the least. From you know, obviously, many people have lost businesses, lost jobs, and stuff. Um, yeah. But in stressful times, in bad times, good things can happen. So as you say, being optimistic, being positive, um, trying to put the right things in place, I'm pretty sure we can, as, as a people globally, get out of this the right side um, with as minimal impacts as we've, we were currently having in regards yeah. to the death toll. The death toll is still pretty low. Um, yeah. I mean, that doesn't bode well for people who have personally lost somebody but you know in the greater scheme of things it's not as it's not as bad it's not billions or millions of people who are dying from this 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 thing so being positive cop always half full trustfully by the end of 2020 it will be a case of whoa you, yeah exactly fingers and toes crossed um <laughs> <laughs> um, it will be like, do you remember that 2020? That was a strange year. That oh, was. That was a weird one. That was a weird one. <laughs> Definitely. So, so back to your um, your fantasy um, fights. I think he was going to pick a female female fight. Yeah. Um, I don't. I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have opened my mouth because now I'm sitting here, you know, matchmaking. Match <laughs> yeah. I would love to see Rose and Zhang Wei Li. I think that that would be an incredible fight. Um, well, isn't that pretty much on the cards? Obviously, it hasn't been officially signed, but isn't yeah, that? It hasn't, yeah, but I, and I, I just will, I want to know when um, it's going to happen, and I want it. I want it to actually happen. I guess I yeah. sometimes, you know, I know Rose has a lot going on in her life, and she's been, you know, touched by yes. what's going on a lot. So I, I, I guess sometimes when when her name gets booked, I'm still like, okay, let's actually see it happen though. Mm. Um, but I would love to see that fight. I can't wait to see that fight. I think that Rose's, Rose's technique and footwork yeah. is actually um, superior to Ioana's. I think, I mean, we saw that. Well, we saw Ioana's that twice. Very good. <laughs> yeah. 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 But her, her footwork is, is really what sets her apart and her ability to find a shot at just the right moment. But then you've got, Zhang Wei Li, who's just ferocious. She's just ferocious, and I don't think she gets affected by much. I don't see, I don't see Zhang getting rocked anytime soon. Now, I, I probably would have said that about Yuana before she fought Rose as well. So I'm probably gonna, you know, have to have to take those words back. But that's gonna be a hell of a fight because I just I don't see Zhang being affected too much by Rose. But I think Rose will be able to get to her uh, in the right moments as long as the consistent yeah. you know bulldozing forward damage that Zhang can bring doesn't affect Rose too much I think that I think that's gonna be a very tough fight for Rose very tough fight especially how heavy especially based upon the you want to fight with uh, Whaley that was something out of this world that was <laughs> true heart guts glory everything yeah. um and the, the hematoma when you you want us oh my gosh Wow. That fight, that fight made me proud to be a female mixed martial artist. That was like, okay, that is what we're all capable of. And to me, not we're all capable of, but you know what I mean? That, that's what the sport's capable of. That to me was a real signal of where women's MMA has, has come, oh, you yeah. know, because there was a time and I'm, and, and it still happens. There, women's MMA is not, at the same place as men's MMA. It's a much younger sport. Mm -hmm. People who participate in it have not been doing it as long. You don't get, you know, NCAA division two wrestlers transitioning over to women's A typically you get good wrestlers, but you know, yeah. it's not, it's not the same. So a lot of times the, the level of technique was not always there. The heart was always there. Of course. The, the desire to go out and fight and put on a good show, which is I think what drew the fan base in and continues to draw the fan base in mm -hmm. the, the ladies bring it, but there wasn't always um, that superior level of technique um, that you'd see on the men's side of things. And yeah. that fight, you saw it. And oh, that was so cool. Definitely. It's, it, it's, it's, it should be inspiring women to, if they don't want to potentially go out into the octagon and fight, 
you know, I want to be able to protect myself. I want to be fit. Yeah. I want to be healthy. I think mixed martial arts, kickboxing, um, Muay Thai, I think it's ex I think all women should be doing some form of uh, martial arts to keep themselves fit and healthy and to protect themselves in these um, worrying times with um, predatory males around the yeah. place. Um, yeah, I think, I think excellent. I think that's excellent. I think that should be, um, and if it's not, that should be in the Talking for Fights Fight of the Year. Oh, it would have to be. It would absolutely have to be. I think, I think uh, at least in terms of the World MMA Awards, I know it is uh, in the running. So um, I, I think the consensus is that that is for sure up there. Got to be top five, if not top three. Definitely, definitely. Um, so let's switch things up a little bit. Um, I know, obviously, you are involved in some extra... Um, outside of the UFC um, activities. Yep. So what, what, what are you getting your fingers and toes into currently? Well, I have Contender Series, which I sort of, not UFC, but sort of is UFC. I've got yes. Contender Series that is starting this coming week. I'll be leaving Monday to head out to Vegas to, to start the, the 10 week back and forth journey that I do. Um, I'm, and I love that show so much. I love that show so, so much. I, and this maybe isn't the best analogy for a, uh, for a UK audience, but here in the United States, we have the NFL draft, which is, even if you're not a football fan, it's a fan, it's hard to, it's hard not to get swept up in the emotion of watching all these guys at home, mm -hmm. waiting to see if they're going to get picked and drafted into the NFL. And to me, the contender series is like, if somehow American football was an individual sport and they had to go play a game, Mm. And then immediately after that game, sit there and, and wait and see if they got drafted. That to me is, is the, the drama and the excitement of the contender series. Cause those guys go out there and those women too, they go out there and they fight their asses off because Dana White is 10 feet away exactly. and contract on the line. Yes. So I've got that coming up. Um, Invicta FC, I've always, Invicta is my home and it's where I got my start. So anytime my schedule allows, um, I'm back working in Invicta. A lot of times I'll have conflict with the UFC and my contract with them states that I kind of have to make that a priority. Priority, yeah. Um, but I, I actually, I was looking at my calendar. I have a week coming up in September where I have four shows in seven days. Whoa. Which is going to make, that's going to make my head explode. I have Invicta <laughs> on a Tuesday, Invicta on a Thursday, a, pay, a UFC pay-per-view on Saturday, and then Contender again the next Tuesday. Wow. I'm like, oh my God, that's going to be rough. <laughs> That's work. <laughs> that is work. That is work. I like that American actor there. That is work. Uh, yeah. So I've got that. And then, you know, in addition to that, I try to stay busy um, outside of, outside of work with, you know, my sponsors and with, I have, I live on a ranch. Uh, so life's, life's all, I just have, I got a puppy. Apparently when I was in Abu Dhabi, my husband and son decided it would be a great time to get a puppy. So I'm dealing with potty training. Uh, a lot going on. <laughs> so you talk about sponsorship let's get into some more detail about that mademoiselle the, yeah, I, uh, uh, go ahead no, go ahead. You, you continue I, w I was gonna say so i i have two companies that um i really am, am super excited about one of which i've been working with for a while and it's a company called directhemp.com i'm a huge fan of cbd and all of the benefits that i've seen from it i was super skeptical about it super skeptical a I don't smoke a lot. I, well, I don't smoke marijuana. Um, and B, so I just kind of associated it with that. Yes. And I was like, that's not really for me. And then B, it sounded like snake oil because everybody kept saying, oh, it does this, it does this, it does that. And my mind's like, how could it do that and that? That, mm. that doesn't make any sense. And so finally I had someone say, listen, just try it. Take it consistently for 30 days. And if you don't like it, you don't like it. And let me tell you, there's, uh, it's become a game changer for me, especially traveling a lot. My ability to sleep and stay asleep is the biggest thing. It doesn't make me tired, but it helps me stay asleep. And when I wake up, I actually feel like I was really asleep and got some rest. So that's one company, directhemp.com. And then I just got involved with another company called Eat to Evolve, and they send um, meal prep, uh, healthy meals throughout the United States right to your door in a refrigerated box and boom, you've got your, uh, your keto or your paleo or whatever you need for the week. So I'm very happy with 
those those two companies yeah. keep me keep me sane i can imagine now with that yeah. meal prep is that more targeted to the athlete or is that for every anybody who wants to have a, a high anybody. quality diet anybody i would say it's it's probably not for cutting weight because those guys that's a whole nother mm. that's a whole nother bag of rice um the it's really for anybody who's kind of just looking to have a consistent healthy lifestyle of eating i'm not i will say this i've i've turned down a lot of people that have offered me sponsorships whether it's um uh, supplements or other meal prep type companies because i've tried it i've been like this is i'm not excited mm. about eating this again or it just wasn't that impressive um and they genuinely above all else it tastes phenomenal i i live on a ranch and so i'm a meat snob i'm a steak snob and their steak was phenomenal their vegetables are are fresh and you can tell that they haven't been overcooked and i'm i'm just i'm super excited about it it's made my life easier already and i've only been working with them for about three weeks now wow so yeah. clearly quality produce is being used yeah, it's and the guy who um, started it, and they have a whole team of actual trained restaurant chefs. The guy who who started it is a Michelin chef, so wow. it's not just that it's good food; it's an interesting palate. Like I just had um, turmeric butter chicken, and it was incredible. Turmeric's very good for you as well, anti-inflammatory and stuff, isn't it? So yeah. yes, good. Okay. Um, is there anything else you want to explore before we wrap up? I don't think so. I just, I appreciate you having me on and, and having such a fun, thoughtful conversation. I don't often get to talk about the, uh, the origin story, if you will. <laughs> that, that's what it's all about. Thanks. That's what it's all about. Um, how can people get in contact with you, Laura? What's your, what's the best social medias? Have you got websites, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. if you can tell us that? I'm by far the most active on Instagram and my Instagram handle is at Laura underscore Sanko, S-A-N-K-O. Um, and I do try, I genuinely try to respond to everybody who uh, either comments um, on, you know, one of my posts or uh, DMs me. If you give me enough time, I will eventually get back to you as long as you're not weird to me. <laughs> <laughs> I will ignore it. Uh, but no, it, yeah, I, I really enjoy interacting with the fans and that's probably the best place. And then also uh, Twitter, exact same handle. I'm not on Facebook a whole lot, to be honest with you. I should, but I just, I kind of focus on Instagram. So if you want to get a hold of me, that's the best place. Well, I think they say Facebook's for the old, old folk. I think I'm sure I've heard of quite a lot of people saying that. So, you know, maybe. You know, yes, possibly. One last thing I've totally yeah. forgot to, I should have asked you this at the start. Sanko, where does that name originate from? Interesting. You know, I think it's Czech. My husband is primarily Lebanese though. He, he's, uh, he, he's, he's definitely Brown. <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> He's mostly Lebanese, but I think he's got a little bit of Czech on his dad's side. Um, and then, uh, yeah, but I'm from my background is I'm mostly Dutch. My, my grandparents are all from the Netherlands. I didn't get the height though. I did not get any of that Dutch height. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say all most, well, you are right. You are right. The multiple times I've been to, to Holland, yes, they are tall. They are sure. tall people. Yes. <laughs> have you, have you been there at all? I have, yeah. I've been there a handful of times and, there's a there's a place in the United States called Holland, Michigan, which is where my family is originally from, my my parents anyway, uh, in Grand Rapids, which is right next to it, which it's almost a running joke how densely populated it is with American Dutch people. I mean, the the phone book is is yeah. a joke in and of it's de young, Vander this, yes. Vander that, you know. It and basically they it, the saying in uh, Grand Rapids is if if you're not Dutch, you're not much. So uh, <laughs> that rhymes as well. Yeah, and my brother went to college there, and he's only 5'8". I remember his freshman year, he called home, and he's like, where have you guys sent me? These women are huge. I can't date anyone here. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget, New York was um, formally named yes, before. New Amsterdam. New Amsterdam. Yeah. Yes, yeah. so you know your history well, mademoiselle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it has been great conversation. Thanks very much for your time. Um, I will leave links below to all of your social medias. Um, and yes, thank you very much. Enjoy the evening. Don't forget, everybody, like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Noble. Appreciate you. <laughs>